if you're not working with a proper accounting team, the problem is only going to come. Like it's, there's not going to be a situation where you're not going to have an issue. It will happen down the line. If for example, you have an auto lease or an auto loan and that loan has been paid for by the business for at least 12 months, that comes off of your personal cash flow. That, and that's the difference we need to get you approved for the type of home that you want. It was never you know, paid for by the business, even though it is for business use. And we can exclude it because we don't have 12 months of documentation for to show that. Something like that is just an easy thing to, to, to do that would make a big difference in the long run. Hi, Jose. Welcome to Keep What You Earn. So excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, no pressure, but I know that a lot of listeners are just like scratching at the chance to listen to this episode with you because you and I have had this conversation already about how uh, it seems like there's a lot going on with uh, mortgage lenders versus business owners and the guidance out there is a little bit vague. And I'm just really excited to dive into more of this conversation on how those listening can maximize their chances at a really smooth lending process. But before we dive in, just tell our listeners a little bit about you, who you are and what you do. Ah, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a never ending battle. Um, (laughs) My name is Jose Tejada. I am a mortgage lender in Beverly Hills, California. Um, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been doing this uh, for almost 20 years. And the reason I started doing this is because in college, I I try to be a, a bank teller. And I was a terrible bank teller and and I couldn't balance my drawer and (laughs) I was going to get fired from being a bank teller. But the branch manager at the time said, hey, you know, you're a bad teller. I was like, I am. And he's like, well, but you're good at people. You want to go try sitting down and and selling some some loans. And so I started selling uh, consumer loans uh, at about uh, 20 years old. And that's what that's what I started my career in banking. Awesome. What makes you uh, so focused on the people side? You know what? I think it's um, my. So I think it's my connection to to the lending and finance world and the fact that I've been working with entrepreneurs and businesses for a really long time. So I've firsthand seen the struggle that they go through. Um, You know, I say to my clients that being a a business owner, being an entrepreneur is literally alchemy, right? You're creating something out of nothing. Um, like nothing, right? You have an idea, maybe you have a product, but no one is knocking at your door, handing you money, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I am connected to that coming from a family of entrepreneurs. My mom is a very big entrepreneur and, and I'm also connected to the side of um, lending and real estate in the sense that um, a lot of our businesses and a lot of our success as immigrants come from, we come from El Salvador and my daughters are the first born Americans, comes from equity appreciation from the very first home that, that my mom purchased after the Northridge earthquake in, in Los Angeles. So wow. there's a lot of connection for me in terms of what happens with equity appreciation on homes and how you can leverage that equity to start businesses. My sister literally went through UCLA from equity from our first home. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So Uh, So I'm really excited that you're on with me and that specifically it's you because we had a conversation before, which led to this episode where you kind of broke down for me, okay, Shannon, here's the real talk of how the lending process works. And I immediately was like, okay, we have to share this with the community of listeners on the show because this is too good. Like nobody is, nobody is explaining this in an easy to understand way. And I feel like it's just this game, uh, the way I, (laughs) I compare it is uh, like the real housewives reunion with Andy Cohen on the couch. And you've got like the real housewives of Beverly Hills on one side, you got, and the other side, you got people who hate each other. And I feel like that's the business owner and the accountant and the lender all the time when it comes to the process in terms of what's being asked, what they need to have prepared and what's going on. So I want to just lay it all out there and share with our listeners. What are your best tips, especially for a business owner, just generally best tips to ensure a smooth lending process for them? That's awesome. You know, I'm really glad that 
your voice is out there in regards to this because um, I love your style of being very common sense about it. Finance doesn't have to, no, so, so you know, and I'm sure it might come up on the bio, but I have a background in wealth management, right? right. I was a financial, uh, not necessarily an advisor, but I was a private banker at a wealth segment of a bank here in, in Los Angeles. And so I've had my investment licenses. The way that we approach our process is holistically in the idea that we're looking at both sides of the coin, not just the debt, but also the, the asset side. Um, but in that background, it's all about planning. And so it could get very complex and it can get very um, detailed when it doesn't have to be. And uh, one of my favorite sayings, I think I might have said this to you before, is that the rocket science isn't hard to rocket scientists, right? So we don't have to make it so complicated. We just have to kind of dissect it and let the client do what they do and take advice from the team that they're building around them, hopefully us. To that point, it doesn't have to be a battle and it shouldn't be a battle. I tell my clients like this, getting a loan is kind of like going to court, right? You have your attorney and you have yourself and you have the judge and you have the law, right? So it's, you want to be as honest as you can with your attorney because that's how you're going to get the best outcome in, the, in what you're trying to do. So lending is kind of that idea. And one of the issues that comes up is that the client may not know that what they're hiding is something that they don't need to hide. Or what they're doing is something that they don't need to be doing, and it's perfectly fine because they're not upfront about it. Um, and I think that sometimes that transcends to the accounting team in terms of not being transparent and open, and instead having a conversation where okay, we can say, okay, let's put everything on the table. Let's figure out how we make this deal work in the best way for the client. Yeah, and I love that approach of making it client-centric at the end of the day, that we want to make sure we're getting the best deal possible for the client because that's who we're all yeah. trying to serve. So a lot of business owners... Uh, subscribe to this idea um, that it's it's more challenging for a business owner to let's say get a mortgage for a primary residence even uh, you know business loans aside if if some people want to participate in this real estate market but they have business income as their primary source let's say they they left their corporate jobs and now they work remotely maybe they're digital nomads I feel like the process is somehow a little bit more difficult in terms of how they have to explain or they have to provide more information on how they earn income. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you've seen and ways to navigate that. And is that a myth that it's more difficult? Um, I'm going to say that it's not necessarily a myth, but it isn't necessarily more difficult. And let me get into, into the, kind of dissecting that idea. So um, First, I think it's important to understand the logic, right? So a lot of times people um, are going to say when they're trying to do a loan, for example, say they're trying to refinance and they have equity in the home and then the lender is not giving them the money or something like that. And they go, well, you can just take my home. It's important to understand that the banks, the lenders, they're not in the business of taking your home. They're in the business of lending you money and you paying them back the money. That's, that's the business they're in. Eventually, you're going to pay them off. They don't care about taking over your home. So what underwriting is, is the understanding of the past to predict the future and to gauge if you as a borrower are good risk. Okay, so that's the general platform of where a lender is coming from in terms of the underwriting process. Now, a business owner, because of the way that their uh, income comes in or its structure, in that sense may have a more difficult time because it's not as straightforward as a W-2 salary earner where it's just, this is what it is, right? These are my deductions, this is my income, that's it. Uh, a business owner is gonna have much more complexity to the way that they earn income. So that's where it gets a little bit um, trickier. Now, it's not necessarily harder in the sense that if you are doing proper planning, if you have a team around you that can do planning throughout the year and has your objectives in mind, like say someone, in January wants to buy a home at, in the following February or March, then you can organize the return in a way where it's not going to be as difficult by how you manage the, the finances. Now, I'll give you an example. For example, there are certain things within a tax return that aren't that can be deductions that aren't necessarily taken uh, out of that can be added back to a uh, uh, business owner's income. On an escort, for example, depreciation, depletion, or non-recurring expenses can be added back. So that's something where it could be a deduction on the return, but it's not going to impact your cash flow in terms of uh, being approved for the loan. So on that note, how can folks identify that for their, their loan officer, right? Because 
I think there might be a, a gap somewhere where are they, do, the, do people know where to look to find that or how to read the tax return to interpret that properly? Because I, I've just seen a lot of struggles with business owners in trying yeah. to do that and handing over the tax return. And they kind of look at it through a certain lens. You mentioned, you know, you can add back depreciation and non-recurring. Well, how do you share that with the loan officer or lender to make them aware that that's what those are? Yeah. And, and that's where it comes to who you're working with matters, right? So for example, um, in, in reality is that in the industry, not everybody is going to know uh, how to properly you know, organize a loan. And that's what I was talking about before in terms of the underwriting guideline for a variety of products. For example, there's, there's in, in underwriting, there's gonna be the guideline and just like in the law, there's the guideline and then there's the interpretation of the guideline. Um, I, I think a, a business owner may not necessarily know themselves. And the only way to know is to make sure that you're working with a proper loan officer that can that can look at your returns and knows how to read tax returns. A lot of times loan officers don't even know how to read tax returns and then is able to work with your accountant about it. For example, let's think of, let's say you have a, a um, business owner that um, uses a lot of machinery. And then when I look at the return, I see there's zero depreciation on it. That's something that I would question and say, is there, should there be more depreciation on, the, on this return? Or for example, a sole proprietor that isn't, uh, that works from home, but isn't um, taking any deductions for business use of home. And on a sole proprietorship, that's something that can be added back as well. Um, so I think maybe it's a, it's a broader answer, but the reality is that you wanna be cautious on who you interview to represent you for that loan. And, and get an idea that that they are they do know what what they're doing in terms of structuring the, the debt. Yes, yeah, I know a lot of business owners, including those listening right now, are thinking, well, when I applied for a loan, I took very conservative approaches to my tax return, and I didn't take advantage of certain strategies. I paid myself, for example, a higher salary as an S corporation owner because I wanted to make this process easier. I wanted to impress the lender and the underwriter. I, you know, maybe didn't take the home office deduction because I told my CPA, hey, ease off the gas pedal on those because I'm trying to apply for a loan and I don't want to rock the boat. What would you say to the people who kind of have that perspective or have done that? Yeah, no, that's and that happens quite often. That happens quite often. And I would say that uh, the collaboration of the accounting team with the loan officer that they're trying to work with um, is going to go a long way in that. Uh, the way that I approach it in my mortgage practice is that I actually look at the returns ahead of time. And I'll, like I said, I will question, I will ask to, to speak to the accounting team and see if there are other things that can be done to improve. If, if Especially if we're planning for something on the following year where I tell clients all the time, you can't go backwards in time. So you have to do planning during the year to make sure that you are set up properly for, for the following year. Now, there are things that are generally going to be um, standard in terms of, of, of getting a mortgage loan. So for example, uh, in the majority of programs, you're going to be capped at 43% debt to income ratio, right? So on okay. a business owner, whatever your net income is, 43% of that can be used to uh, cash flow your consumer debt, meaning anything that shows up on your credit report, um, credit cards, cars, student loans, um, things you may have co-signed for, and your mortgage payment. OK, so there is not it's not necessarily a shot in the dark. It's more about um, strategizing to maximize both sides of the equation. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is also making your accounting team aware of you going through this process sooner rather than later, because from where I sit, I know that a lot of my clients will reach out to me after they're in. Let's say they're in the final stages and they want to, you know, either refinance or they want to get a loan and they're asking me for all that really they, all the interaction I usually have is my client asking me for a letter that says, Hey, can you just tell these guys that you do my taxes and that I started my business last year and just state a few facts that are all true and put this in a letter for them. And, and that's usually the extent I know about it or the first time I hear about it. So I think a lot of it is assembling that team and communicating, right? Oh, 100%, especially as a business owner. If you're not working with a bookkeeper, if you're not working with a proper accounting team, um, you're only, like the problem is only going to come. Like it's, there's not going to be yeah. a situation where you're not going to have an issue. It will happen down the line. Um, and, and this is the song that I sing constantly to my uh, self-employed clients. 
Um, a big one, for example, that is missed often, it, just kind of speaking about the planning, is that um, if, for example, you have an auto lease or an auto loan, and that loan has been paid for by the business for at least 12 months, that comes off of your personal cash flow, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it could be a very expensive car payment. It could be like $600, you know, $600 $750. That, and that's the difference we need to get you approved for the type of home that you want. And we don't, it, it was never, you know, paid for by the business, even though it is for business use. Um, and we can exclude it because we don't have 12 months of documentation for, to show that something like that is just an easy thing to, to, to do that would make a big difference in the long run. That's interesting. Yeah. And what other, on that note, what other sort of mistakes can people avoid if they're business owners looking to get a loan for a, a home? You know, what have you seen that could trip up the process? Yeah. So uh, a lot of it is going to come around the structure of the tax return, right? The, the income part of it, the cash flow part of it. I think that the, the main thing is not, um, and probably in a lot of times, just not giving your accounting team the right information, not having those scheduled planning meetings. Uh, you should have, I tell my clients, you should have a meeting at the beginning of the year and at the and sometime in November, uh, October, November, uh, mandatory so that you can calibrate exactly what has happened throughout the year and that those things match up to where you want to be, um, you know, the following year, if you're, if you are looking to, to secure financing. Um, so I would say that the organization of debt and the separation of business debt versus personal debt is probably the largest thing that we see uh, with uh, business owners. Um, sometimes it could come down to the fact that they're just not taking any income themselves and they're not taking the mandatory type of income that they should be getting uh, after a certain time of the, the say it's an escort being in, in motion. And something like that is where the underwriter is going to question, like, what, how can you borrow money if you're not even taking any income yourself? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And on that note, um, how much does time in business play a factor when evaluating as well? I love that question. Okay. That's a great question. So let me tell you something. So first let's understand that in, uh, in the United States of America, there, are, we are separated by limits in terms of lending per County. And I think you and I touched on that before. So every yeah. County has a limit of what is considered a conforming loan. Now, these are categories of loans. Uh, the, the level above conforming would be considered a jumbo loan, which is generally going to be the, the, a home that is higher priced in whatever county that you're in. So a conforming loan, for example, in Los Angeles is going to tap out at um, $970,800. It's, it's a lot because it's in a high cost area. Right. Um, in most of the country, it's going to be around $647,200. Now, these are loans that are generally going to be sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Collectively, these are called the agencies. Now, the reason I'm going to take in this long way to answer this question is because if you're doing a conforming loan that more than likely 90% is going to be sold to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, the guideline is going to be a lot easier than if you're doing a jumbo loan that Fannie and Freddie don't, they don't buy jumbo loans. So um, Freddie Mac, for example has a rule that if you have been in business for at least five years, you only need uh, one year of tax returns to, to, to qualify for a loan. Okay. In most cases. Okay. So what happens? Say you've been in business for seven years. Say you had one year where you broke your leg and you didn't work. And then the following year, your leg healed and now you're doing great. Well, if you were going to take a two-year average, that loan may not qualify. But if it's a conforming loan and we go to Freddie Mac and, and use them as the lender, then all we need is one year and voila, now we qualify just fine. Um, that's going to go back to working with a lender that is that has experience, that is reputable, and that understands how to look at different programs that may fit that, that particular borrower's criteria. But that strategy on its own has saved a lot of transactions. So... Uh... It seems like, just from my experience, it's challenging to sort of question or to push back on requests made by the lender. And I think it's also due to the, the borrower you know, being stressed out. This is not a, exactly a fun process to go through for, for most borrowers. Yeah. Uh, I would say I don't know anyone who particularly celebrates it or enjoys it uh, on the borrower side. But, you know, in thinking about that, you know, what... Uh, what could they do to, to, again, make the process more seamless, but also to, to be proactive 
about getting the, the items they need up front or to, to make it go a little bit smoother? Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah, no, fantastic question. Um, okay. The main thing they can do is to not purposely separate uh, the, the accounting team from the finance, financing team, right? Mm-hmm. That's the main thing you want to do. If you can connect them to work together, you know, us and accountants speak the same language. We kind of know what we're looking for. It makes this process easier for the client by then, you know, by taking themselves out of the middle of that. The second thing is to understand that loans are essentially three things. They are assets, they are cash flow, and they are credit right? Mm. So credit is pretty straightforward. You either have the credit or don't have the credit to meet the the, the type of loan that we're trying to get. Um, Assets are going to have to do with you have enough to have the down payment uh, plus closing costs for a transaction. And if you're doing a jumbo loan, oftentimes you're going to be asked to have reserves beyond the down payment and closing costs. And so do you have those as well in terms of assets? Um, One thing to note on that is that most lenders will allow Business assets, if the self-employed person is 100% owner or, and sometimes if it's majority owner, but not if it's a very, it's a completely shared um, entity. So in that, in that stance, that, that's important because as you know, once assets are moved from business to, to personal, they, they could become taxable. So now mm-hmm. that's something that, that uh, a, a self-employed person needs to definitely be aware of. Definitely, um, definitely. And then in terms of, of cash flow, um, then it's just, you know, having those conversations about, do I have enough to, to be at that general 43% debt to income ratio? Now I say general because there are a lot of programs. There's this ocean of programs that can be used, but the majority of them are going to be at about that uh, requirement for debt to income ratio. Um, underwriting is, is part guideline and part interpretation of that guideline. Like it's impossible for, for any program to encompass every single scenario, right? Mm-hmm. So it's important to, to have those conversations, be open on the conversations and say, this is everything I have. You know, my right. job is to help you get the, get the loan done. So for a client to, to lie to me or, or withhold information doesn't help the client, just like it doesn't help you in your practice, right? right, like, right. Tell me what you got. Let's do this open kimono style so that I can help you get to where you want to go, you know? Absolutely. And, and I, I tell business owners, don't be afraid to push back in a healthy way on some of the requests, because sometimes what they're asking doesn't translate into the situation of the borrower, which is again, a a reflection on choose your team. Right. But also, uh, when they ask for certain things, sometimes we have to push back a little bit to get clarification, right. Instead of just trying to guess what they want. Like I use the example with you, Jose, when we talked and I said, how many times have I been asked for audited financial statements? And realizing that a lot of folks don't realize what that entails Correct. and they're just, and the borrower is just, of course, passing on the request over to me yeah. and it just creates a whole lot of confusion. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And one easy thing to do, and it doesn't have to be combative is simply ask, can you send me the copy of the guideline that asks for this? Yeah. Right? Simply like that. Um, and so, and, and the thing is that even when, when, when I deal with underwriters, right, sometimes an underwriter might be interpreting a guideline one way, I might be interpreting it a different way. And the reality is that it could go both ways, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. now you go, okay, let me get on the phone with Shannon and have a conversation about this business. And let's understand what happened. I'll give you a very good example. I was doing a transaction in New York. Okay. The, mm-hmm. the file, it was a purchase transaction in upstate New York. It, the file originally gets declined. The reason it got declined is because of cash flow issues. I knew there weren't any cash flow issues as I had reviewed the file ahead of time. Once I got into the underwriter's comments, I realized that she didn't realize that the only reason that the, the numbers looked the way they did is because they had the accountants, he switched accounting teams and the new accounting team switched them from a fiscal year to a calendar year, right? So now right. all the numbers moved. And so I, I argued to her, I said, the guideline says that if there is a one-time occurrence that isn't likely to continue, then um, this should, it should be ignored and it should be reviewed in a global uh, you know, cash flow, taking one extra year of, of income. So all of a sudden, the loan gets approved and we close on time, right? Right. But these are the things that 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 not every loan officer is going to know. And you have to, like you said, in a healthy way, push back to an underwriter and say, no, 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 no. I understand what you're saying because you're looking at the cash flow and it, it's it's failing. But 
it's only failing because of this thing that happened only one time. And right. then, of course, I had to get a CPA letter and, and, and explain that. And so then I had to go say, look, CPA, I know you told me what happened, but my underwriter needs proof that this is what happened coming from you. So yeah. the guy was like, yeah, no problem. We'll tell you what happened. He came, we had, took him in as a client X year. We, after we reviewed his, his past returns, we recommended that he do this. And this is when we started it. And that's the proof that we needed. That's perfect. And that's, that just goes to show you how working together and getting to the root of it is really where you get the best results. Now, yeah, um, I mean, another way that that could have gone is that it could have simply just said, look, it's not going to work. We're not going really right, to right. cash flow. Absolutely. So, uh, so as we kind of wrap things up here, Jose, uh, what are some great resources that you recommend? For example, you mentioned the debt to income ratio and I know my listeners, I know you guys are action takers. You guys have already tried to Google that, (laughs) how to calculate that. So what, what are some good resources you have on perhaps either calculating the debt to income ratio or learning more about, uh, conforming loan versus jumbo loan in your County, right? What other, what are the resources that you have or, do you have a place where you could send our listeners to, to get more information about those things? Yeah. A lot of that information is going to be on my page um, itself. There's going to be a lot of articles that you can get from my page. Other than that, um, I would say that if you go into your investopedia or bankrates.com, the pretty common, there's going to be a lot of articles that, that talk about this. Um, but if you go through the guarantee rate and my page specifically, there's going to be a lot of articles that talk about all aspects of lending. Um, you can literally search through a catalog and, and see what, what topic uh, interests you. So, yeah. Awesome. We'll make sure we link that in the show notes for all of you listening so you can explore more information about all of these topics and what Jose does. Jose, do you have any uh, parting words to our listeners? Anything, piece of advice or a place where they can learn more about you? Yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, so definitely my page. Um, I think that I gave you my my socials if they can be tagged here. I, I do Absolutely. a lot of Instagram videos talking about uh, finance topics, real estate topics. Um, love for you to follow me and, and, and be friends. Um, I think that in terms of closing thoughts, um, it's just look, I've been I've been coaching and working with business owners for over decades. And, and let me tell you that the best thing you can do. The best thing you can do is hire a team around you that's going to, you know, take save you problems down the line and take a lot of the pressure off. Um, I think that in my experience, business owners know, for example, that they're not keeping up with their bookkeeping. They know that they don't have exact controls. Um, and, and one of the things that I learned early in my career was that if you can count it, you can control it. So it's very important to, to have that. Um, one thing that I've learned now, um, having left uh, banks and being out on my own, is that um, a lot of the answers to, to, to business owners' problems is not how, but who. And I think yeah. that and that's been a huge eye-opening thing for me, is to let go of, of trying to do everything. And, and the thing is that um, I'm a firm believer that you're never going to be good at anything you're not naturally good at. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you exactly. can get better, right? Like, I, can get, I, I can get better uh, at my calendar, but my assistant is good, really good at my calendar. Like yeah. she's going to do a better job than I can at managing the meetings and, and whatnot, right? So um, I think that that's been my mantra a lot lately is like, listen, when I do, when I do meetings, when I do masterminds, when I sit down with either agents or business planners, I go, I, I listen to them and I go, listen, you got to look at it as who, not, not how. And, I, I, and a lot of the times that, um, that idea of, um, it's like, if you break down hourly, what your time costs, right? Like yes. for me, like this is how, this is how I learned it. Right. This is funny. So the guy goes, how much do you make a year? I tell him, I make this much. A year. He goes, okay, break it down in two hours. Okay. This is this much an hour. How much, you know, would you pay somebody to pull credit reports? I'm like, I don't know, $20 an hour. Okay. Are you paying yourself a lot more than that? Oh yeah. Right. Now I'm spending a ton of money to pull a credit report if I'm doing it myself. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. um, I I subscribe to the same thing. Totally. So building a team early, building a team, long-term plan with long-term people is my, my philosophy. Um, I think that that's my best advice. And then you can focus on doing exactly what you do building your own rocket science. (laughs) I love it. Building your own rocket science. Thank you so much, Jose. And and one more question for you is, are you restricted geographically to work with only business owners in California or are you uh, nationwide? No, we're nationwide. Guarantee rate can land in any any state in the, in the nation. 
Fantastic. So guys, check out Jose's page, check him out on social media, let him know if you have questions or want to work with him. Uh, I really appreciate the perspective you bring to the table, Jose, and looking at this whole process with more of the eye of a teacher, the heart of a teacher and, uh, and, and really keeping the business owner as the primary focal point. So I really, that's what we have in common and why I think, uh, I knew that our listeners would benefit from a conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Ciao.